Well ladies and gentlemen, hello again, welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. We're back in X-Plane 10 and today we're going to take a look at radio navigation. We're flying the uh, default Beach B-58 Baron and we're in the vicinity of Malta out in the Mediterranean. Radio navigation is really an uh, interesting subject, so what we'll do is we'll have a look at the, uh, the map first of all. I'll pause the sim, we'll have a chat about what we're going to do and why we're going to do it. So we're around Malta, we've got the Luca NDB here, non-directional beacon. We're flying directly towards that. We'll fly outbound on a course of 270 degrees. Uh, we'll pick up uh, radial towards Gozo, fly inbound on the 150 radial, so course 330 degrees. We'll fly an arc at about five or six miles around Gozo, fly outbound again, pick up another radial to come back in on, then fly down towards the Luca NDB, going towards Malta NDB, outbound on the ILS for a procedure turn and back in to land. Let's have a look inside the aircraft and we'll look at the instruments we're going to use for that before we go too much further. There's four instruments I'm really interested in today. Uh, the autopilot is doing the flying. I'm going to steer the autopilot using the heading bug. So the, the primary flying instruments, uh, the autopilot's looking after all of that. It's the nav instruments I'm interested in today. First and foremost, I've got the HSI, the Horizontal Situation Indicator. That's tuned to nav radio one. Uh, although it's got the GNS uh, 530 here, uh, the frequencies are exactly the same. That's uh, NAV1 and that's also NAV1. We'll just be using this one for simplicity. So the HSI, we've also got the uh, course deviation indicator, the CDI, down here. That's getting its information from the uh, NAV radio 2. You'll see I've got the same uh, standby frequencies and the same secondary frequencies because I want to compare how these two instruments behave. We're also going to be using the uh, ADF, the Automatic Direction Finder. Uh, on this aircraft it's tuned over here, so 416 for the Luca. And uh, I've got a DME, a slaved DME over here. So it can get its information either from uh, NAV1 or NAV2. However, the only thing it's getting from those radios is the frequency to use. DME works on a, a different set of frequencies. It works a, a much higher frequency. And the NAV radio is saying to the DME set 115.7. The DME is looking up its own table to find out which frequency to use, tune in the correct frequency, and then identing that for us. So the DME is a, a little bit of a different technology, but to all intents and purposes, it can be considered to work on the uh, same frequency as the VORs. So at the moment, we're tra tracking towards the uh, Luca NDB. I'll take the pause off and we'll continue with that. So when we're flying an instrument that simply has a needle, this uh, ADF is being a, a good example for us. Also, uh, the RMI, like you'd find on the uh, uh, IXAG model, it's the same kind of uh, process you use for flying. Whenever you think about this instrument here, I want you to think of the phrase, push the head, pull the tail. Okay, if I want to fly onto, let's say, a track uh, 270 degrees, I need to push the head of the needle. So this is my uh, heading indicator. Uh, it's actually the track we're flying we're interested in, so a little bit of wind drift, but there's no wind in the sim today, so this is the way we're flying. And if I move the aircraft slightly to the left, what will happen is this uh, will effectively push that needle round to the right. It's going to push the needle away from the heading and it's going to pull the tail towards the heading. Let's try and get uh, from 2.4 to 2.5, 2.55 inbound. We're quite close to the uh, the beacon already, so that may not uh, may not work in the space we've got available. But there's some time later on to have a look at that as well. The ADF here it's using a antenna on the undersurface of the aircraft to identify relative to the aircraft heading where the uh, radio station is. The fact that this card here is moving uh, the same as the uh, directional gyro or the compass is uh, is really beneficial. Not all aircraft are like that. Some of them have a fixed card and that's far harder to fly with. So there's uh, 240, 250, 260. We're really quite close to the, uh, the beacon as I said. So let's just come around on to about uh, 270, uh, 265 initially. And what I want to do is to fly over the top of the beacon and then go outbound exactly on the 270 radial. Whenever you're doing instrument flying, it's always important to know where the wind's coming from. 
Um, you can calculate uh, using the uh, a few rules of thumb. You can calculate the uh, maximum drift the aircraft's going to experience, and then you just uh, imagine uh, a track line maybe uh, a few degrees to the left or a few de degrees to the right. Modern airliners, they've got that uh, capability anyway. That makes it nice and easy. So you see the uh, NDB passing down the left side of the aircraft. The tail comes up, and I want to fly outbound on 270. So this uh, heading here, effectively, it's pulling the tail of the needle towards it. 270, that's uh, that's all I want. I'll fly outbound exactly on 270. If I want to change uh, the radial I'm flying outbound on, it's really quite easy. We'll let it establish on 270 for a, a second or so, and then we'll change. Quick look outbound, outside. The main airport at uh, Malta here. I think there's a, an older airfield uh, around about here somewhere, and uh, Gozo is up there. Okay, so we're with nil wind, we're exactly on that 270 course. Let's say I want to move from flying outbound on 270 to outbound on 280. What I need to do is to pull the tail of the needle. So I'll come right by uh, 30 degrees initially. What's going to happen is that tail of the needle is going to start to move towards the heading. There you go, it's coming through 275. And the closer we are to the station, the quicker that needle will move. So if we were about uh, 20 miles away, it would move at a much slower rate than it's moving at the moment. There we go, just coming on to 280. I'll come back to the left, on to 280 degrees, and fly outbound. I mentioned that some aircraft uh, don't have this uh, rotating card, uh, rotating compass card behind it. Uh, if it's only got a, a fixed card, there's usually a little knob here, and you can adjust the um, the background card. Just almost exactly the same as you can do with the OBS selector here. It makes it a lot harder to fly uh, on NDBs though. The aircraft I did my first instrument rating in, uh, it was uh, right out your scan, it was all the way over here. A single instrument with the frequency selector and the uh, moving card. Really quite awkward to fly with, but uh, satisfying in its own uh, way as well. So, tracking outbound on the 280. Let's have a look at the map and see what we've done so far. We uh, kind of drove roughly towards uh, Luca on that 270, went outbound on the 270, and then we've adjusted our course onto the 280 and we're flying outbound on that. So the only indication that's been given here is uh, a pointer from the aircraft towards the station. The VOR is a little bit different. The VOR uh, is quite complicated from an electronic perspective. It's got uh, uh, FM and AM transmissions all overlapped uh, to generate a phase difference. And that phase difference is interpreted by equipment on the aircraft. What it means is the aircraft knows which radial it's on, and if you tell the aircraft by using the uh, heading selector or the OBS selector which radio you want to fly on, it can give you a deviation from that course as well. So at the moment it's giving me a fly left indication on the HSI. These two instruments are, gen are displaying exactly the same information. The difference is that uh, the HSI here, the course selector, rotates with the compass card, whereas on this instrument, the CDI, it's a fixed instrument and the only thing that rotates around the outside is the selector. This one's a little bit harder to use um, when you're doing quite complicated procedures, but for things like the ILS approach, it's actually really quite usable, it's quite easy. This one's a more graphic representation of what's actually happening. If imagine that, that line as a point in space, we can see that it's ahead of the aircraft and we're going to turn right to fly inbound. If you only have this instrument here, what's important to know is that you're currently flying on course 280 degrees. So imagine the mouse cursor for a moment is my uh, little airplane. I'm heading on course 280 degrees, so I'm going to be travelling this way. So as, the, uh, as we get closer to the radial, the needle comes towards us, just as it does here. 
I'm only seven miles away from the station, so the intercept's happening really quite quickly. I'll turn towards. When I first started flying uh, Flight Sim 4, uh, way back in the early 90s, this was, uh, this was uh, represented quite well in that simulator. I remember flying around uh, Chicago using a photocopy of the back of the instruction manual as a sectional chart to try and plot positions between the, uh, between the VOR stations. Many years later, having this available in flights that made it uh, made the process of getting an instrument rating uh, a lot easier because I already knew the basics of how these uh, VOR stations uh, operated. It was really quite um, beneficial to have that available to us. So we're flying towards uh, Gozo just now. It's out there somewhere. I don't know if you can see the VOR. Perhaps that's it there. Yeah, there's the VOR station. And we're tracking inbounds on the zero, uh, 150 radial. So course 330 degrees. And I'll just adjust the heading to keep the, uh, the deviation bar centralised. As we approach the station, keep an eye on the DME here. DME is the actual distance to the station. The station's on the ground, we're going to pass over at 3,000 feet. 3,000 feet is uh, just about half of a nautical mile. Uh, the elevation on the uh, station is probably about uh, 200 feet or so. So this will count down to about 0.5 or 0.4 before starting to go back up again. The speed indicator as well is also the closure rate on the station. So as we pass overhead, you'll see that decrease down to zero and then start to increase back up again. That's going to be quite useful when we're doing the DME arc as well. And the final function here is the time till we get to the station. So if we have a look at the uh, GPS just very briefly, ground speed on here is 173 versus 165, 164 it's coming down to. That's just as we pass overhead the beacon. As we get really close, you'll see the needle gets really quite sensitive. So we'll maybe see a course deviation. Uh, we don't want to make any rapid adjustments. If you were passing overhead, you wouldn't maybe use leave it in nav mode. You just fly it on the heading bug for a little while so it doesn't try and steer like crazy to, to follow that. Once we're outbound, a little white arrow indicates the stations behind us. And everything's working in the correct sense again. Adjust the heading bug uh, as appropriate to track outbound. Because I've got nil wind, I can more or less put the heading bug on the uh, course selector and fly outbound. Um, there's a few VORs around the world that are a little bit unusual. Uh, almost all VORs are oriented towards magnetic north. Uh, some VORs could be oriented towards true north if there's a significant difference. Uh, in that case, having the uh, heading bug on the course pointer wouldn't really work that well. That's really quite a specialist subject, so I don't want to confuse things with that. But in simple terms, all you've got to account for is the wind drift. So if there was a, if the wind drift was about 10 degrees to the right, I'd put the course pointer 10 degrees to the left and I'd fly outbound quite happily. Let's just check that out on the map. So there we go. We flew outbound on the NDB, that was the 280 from the NDB. We intercepted the uh, 150. We can see on the, the rose indicator here, um, north uh, on the VOR is not quite north aligned as far as the aircraft uh, or as far as the sim is concerned. And that's quite common. Um, the VORs aren't always kept perfectly aligned to magnetic north. The published radios on the charts, however, should always work. Uh, they should be within a few degrees of the uh, actual magnetic heading. It's one of these things that if you think about it too much, it uh, starts to hurt your head. It's easier just to, to fly the aircraft with the, the published headings and it should all work out. So the next thing I'm going to demonstrate is a DME arc. The DME, the distance measuring equipment down here, when it gets to about 5.1, 5.2 miles, I'm going to start a 90 degree turn. That will put the VOR and the DME off my right wing tip and I'll basically fly around keeping that distance the same. Watch what happens to the ground speed as I start the turn, or the, uh, the closure speed. So from this point onwards, the only thing I'm interested in is the uh, closure speed and the distance. 
I will set the ANU track on here. I want to go outbound on the 090. So there's six miles. I'm still moving away from the station about 100 knots or so. If it stays within half a mile, I'm quite happy with that tolerance. Doing a DME arc at uh, six miles out is really quite challenging. Uh, the further you are from the station, the longer it takes, but uh, the easier it is to correct any little errors you've got. So now my closure rate to station is zero. I'm not getting any closer, I'm not getting any further away. If I move, move the nose further to the right, I'll start to get closer to the station. And that's what I want, because I want to be flying six miles away. So I'm now closing on the station at uh, 20 knots. At that rate it would take me about uh, a minute to get that uh, point 0.2 back. So I'll keep uh, turning the aircraft on the bug so that I've got a reasonable closure rate. You see, if I stopped on the aircraft, the wings are level, the closure rate will start to decrease to zero, and then I'll get further away. That's just as I pass the, uh, the tangent to the uh, station. If you don't have the um, ground speed indicator on a DME, it's no problem, you just do it based on the distance. Uh, in real life, it doesn't update quite as quickly as this, so you can actually do a much better job on X-Plane than you would do in real life. The end result is you, you get the aircraft to exactly where you want it uh, by whatever means necessary. Just adjusting the heading bug to keep the closure rate uh, around about zero. If I get too close, I'll let the aircraft fly on a set heading to get further away. If I get too far away, I'll turn the aircraft in a little bit tighter to uh, keep it tracking towards the station. Getting a little bit further away. Let's bring the nose in again. I'm going to go outbound on the 090. So when I'm uh, on about uh, 165 or 170 uh, course, I'll transition from following that arc around to intercepting the radial outbound. So although you can see airliners flying DME arcs making perfect arcs in the sky, we're more or less doing uh, straight lines, little turn, straight line, little turn. The end result is the same, the aircraft stays roughly in the same point of space that we're interested in. So it's going down to 5.8. If I was doing this out at 20 miles, I'd want to keep it really exactly on 20, because it's, it's possible to do that. But in as close as 6 miles, it's difficult. And the faster the aircraft goes, the harder this is as well. See my uh, closure rate is actually, uh, I'm actually going further away from the station for 14 knots away. That distance will start to build up again. If you've got an RMI with a pointer to the station, it's obviously a lot easier. You just keep the pointer at 90 degrees to the aircraft with, uh, or the aircraft track and everything works out. This is the harder way to do it. Okay, so that's more or less where I want to be. Six miles out, only 10 degrees off. I'll make that turn left and pick up the uh, 090 radial outbound, hopefully. Watch my ground speed, or my uh, closure speed, as uh, I turn to fly directly away from the station. It'll become closer to my ground speed. I'm expecting around 170 knots or so. There we go. Outbound on the 090 radial. So from flying outbound on the 090, let's say I want to fly inbound on the 080. That'll be a course of 260 towards. I'll put 260 at the top of this uh, uh, CDI here. 
just refine that. I'll make the turn when I get to about uh, 12 to 15 miles. But just to think about this, uh, what we're going to do here, this would seem to indicate a right turn is required. But remember, it's not always as simple as that with the CDI. What we want to keep in mind is our actual heading. At the moment, uh, our actual heading or our track is uh, 090 degrees, more or less. So imagine my aircraft flying from the centre of the instrument towards 090. If my aircraft was flying this way, it would need to make a left turn to come to that bar there. Despite the fact it's on the right hand side of the instrument. And that's where the HSI presentation makes life an awful lot easier. Let's stick the heading exactly on 090 degrees and I'll spin the course selector around. The 260 inbound, exactly the same as I wanted on the uh, CDI. But when I select that there, you'll see it's off on the left hand side of the aircraft. If you imagine this whole instrument here transposed, so you, you pick it up, you lift it and you turn it around so it's upside down and that yellow arrow there becomes the same position as that yellow arrow there, then it's a fly right uh, indication versus this uh, uh, fly right indication here to make a left turn to pick up that line. Another interesting rule of thumb is how far away this radial is from us at the moment. We're going outbound on the 090 and I'm going to pick up the 080, so 10 degrees. If I was 60 miles away, 60 miles, 10 degrees would be 10 miles. The 1 in 60 rule, 1 degree, 60 miles, 1 mile. I'm not 60 miles though, I'm coming on 15 miles, that's 4 times less. So 10 degrees, 10 miles, divided by 4, 2.5 miles. So that radial is 2.5 miles to the left. Just a little bit less than that as we start the turn. Let's spin the uh, heading bug round and we'll, watch, uh, we'll make the aircraft intercept. You'll see as the uh, HSI rotates it becomes closer in uh, visual representation to what the CDI is telling us here. So not impossible to fly with the CDI. I did my uh, initial instrument rating using a CDI and a fixed card ADF but the HSI makes life a lot easier. The ground speed went to zero, that means I was uh, not closing, not gaining on the DME station, so I was at exactly 90 degrees towards it. And what we'll do is we'll pick up this, uh, try and pick up this radial and fly inbound on it. So 15 miles away, 14 miles away, I can do quite a leisurely intercept now. See the needles moving at a much slower rate than it was when I was only five miles away from it. I'll wait till it's almost on top of us and then I'll make the turn onto the heading. And that's us tracking back in towards the Gozo VOR. Let's have a look at the map, see how that worked out. So there we go. If I get the uh, rows there, so it's almost saying six miles. So that's a six mile radius we've flown around. Remember we went outside a little bit as we started the turn, we refined it in, got into about 5.7, so more or less six miles all the way around. That's as, uh, as good as it gets with this sort of instrument. We then went outbound on the 090, we've turned around to track the 080 back in. That's the intercept heading, as it comes around we'll, hum, we'll come back towards the, uh, the beacon. I'm not going to fly all the way towards the beacon though, what I'm going to do is uh, break off and fly a course towards the uh, Luca NDB and we'll show tracking inbound to an NDB. So we'll fly in just for a little bit. The course I'm interested in flying towards the uh, NDB, remember it's still tuned, uh, still tuned on the ADF receiver. I'm interested in the 135 course. That's the uh, little line here. Remember, push the head, pull the tail. As I'm flying this way, I'm pushing the head away from me and I'm pulling the tail towards. That's exactly what I want. When it gets to about uh, 140, I'll start the turn and track in on the 135.
I did my um, my instrument rating finally on a, a Piper Seneca 2, which is uh, an ideal aircraft to try and do the instrument rating in. It's um, it's an aircraft that I didn't really enjoy flying at the time because the instrument rating is really uh, really hard work. But looking back on it, it's quite a, a satisfying bit of training. The end result is uh, well worth it. So there's one four zero on the needle here. I'll start the turn towards. It was 135 I was interested in. So I'll set 135 initially and see what happens. One of the issues you have with an ADF is it can't really be trusted in the turn. As the aircraft banks, there's all sorts of interference from the wings and the uh, orientations of the antenna, that sort of thing. You'll hear it described as ADF dip. The sim doesn't model it that well. I don't think it models it at all, in fact, but ADF, uh, NDB, not to be trusted in a turn at all. So level the wings, take the reading, make an adjustment. You'll find that it's not um, it's not obviously as precise as doing uh, GPS navigation, but that's to be expected. There you go. So it's one three five. I'm probably just uh, maybe about one three four. So I'll bring it uh, left a little bit and push the needle back the way I want it to go. One three five. When you're flying uh, for your instrument rating test, you'll find the aircraft has uh, got uh, blinds fitted, uh, kind of almost like Venetian blinds or vertical blinds fitted, so the pilot flying can't uh, see where they're going at all, but the instructor in the right-hand seat or the examiner can still see out through the slots and the blinds to uh, to keep an eye out for for other aircraft, because you may be flying in VMC conditions, but uh, with the pilot learning the visual skills. can sometimes feel quite, quite uh, claustrophobic. You're flying along with this lovely environment around you, and uh, you've got these screens a few inches from your head to stop you seeing where you're going. Tracking that 135 towards, let's say I want to make an adjustment onto the 150 course inbound to the uh, NDB. So push the head, I'll turn away, and that should push the head towards 150. There's maybe a, a tiny little bit of uh, ADF dip showing there. It did seem to, to lean slightly, so we'll have a look at that in the turn. While we're intercepting that, I'll reach in the ILS frequencies here and I'll set the uh, HSI and the CDI to the inbound course. That inbound course has been uh, catching a few people out with the IXEG sim, uh, I think, so we'll have a, a little chat about that once we've, uh, once we've intercepted. Looking for the needle uh, to come around to 150 and then we'll turn to fly towards it again. It still stays, uh, it's quite accurate even with the uh, angle of bank on there. So maybe there's not much ADF uh, dip. Larger aircraft uh, are usually compensated electronically, so there isn't uh, a dip present on the uh, indicator. But on a much more basic aircraft, ADF dip is a, a real problem. And if you're trying to do NDB holds uh, for your instrument rating test, then that's one of the hardest things to get right. There you go, so it's just uh, more or less on the 150. I'll point it towards, and uh, it's actually the next beacon I'm interested in just now. So I'll change it to 395, uh, that's the MLT, which is on the uh, 
ILS track. And what we'll do is we'll fly towards that on a southerly heading. So once it comes round to south, again we're pushing the head round. Once it comes round to pointing to the south, we'll fly towards that. Before we do that, let's take a look at the map. So, here's the uh, Luca VOR. Uh, sorry, the Luca NDB. Initially, we were flying towards it on the 135, and then we made a change to fly towards the 150 instead. And you can see the track we're flying there is perfectly aligned on the 150, or the 330 inbound. What we're going to do now is to track towards the uh, Malta NDB, fly outbound, back coursing the localizer, do a procedure turn, and come in back to fly the ILS. So it's coming on to southerly heading. We'll turn to the right. If you fly an aircraft uh, that's got a G1000 fit or, or similar, the uh, system has the ability to overlay a pointer for the NDB if you've got it fitted, the uh, ADF needle. It'll also put a uh, RMI needle on there. Uh, basically the same kind of instrument except for, for the VOR. And it can also show you a pointer towards the uh, GPS unit as well, the GPS waypoint, all overlaid on an HSI, which is really quite uh, useful. It's technology that uh, much bigger airliners don't have. There's a lot of flexibility in the G1000 system, but it makes it quite complicated to do, uh, have a proper sim of it. I've got about uh, probably 140, 150 hours behind a, a G1000. It's, uh, it's an interesting device to fly with. Let's take a quick look outbound, outside. There's the runway, so we're getting really quite close to it. And we'll fly out to uh, back course localizer. Now, here's the localizer on the uh, deviation bar here. Although I'm flying towards this uh, NDB, I know from experience that we're really quite close to the localizer, and a 30 degree intercept on the localizer is probably a little bit too much at this distance. So I start to turn a little bit early, just to refine that turn on. Localizer is very similar to the VOR technology, but it's not identical. I'll show you one of the uh, differences as we track inbound. I'll also start bringing the power back a little bit, because we need to start descending soon. There's the deviation bar. We'll just fly outbound. You can see it on the uh, CDI as well. So I said it's it's similar to VOR, but it's not identical. Well, it's uh, not identical because when you're using an ILS, the OBS selection position doesn't matter for the presentation. Likewise, the HSI position doesn't matter for the visual presentation. And this is where SIMS and the IXEG model are confusing people. And the IXEG model is exactly correct. It's uh, more rudimentary SIMS that are making people have trouble with intercepting the ILS. So the visual picture doesn't matter, but the autopilot needs to know how to find the ILS if it's not centralized on it. Okay, so if it's not on the bar, it needs to know which way the ILS is. So if the localizer is off to this side, then the autopilot will fly an intercept based on this heading selector, this course selector here. If you don't line that up, it just won't work correctly. And other sims don't really do that, whereas the IXEG model uh, does. So I think that's what's been causing people to have problems with intercepting the ILS. I'll start descending down to 2,500 feet. Just do it with, a, uh, with the autopilot still. Now, at 2,500 feet, the glide slope will be about 7.5 miles. So when I get to seven miles, I'm going to start my procedure turn, and you'll see how a procedure, uh, a procedure turn works. It's important I fly at more or less a consistent airspeed, uh, otherwise it'll get uh, a little bit interesting. But about 130 knots or so, that'll work fine. There's uh, seven miles. I'm going to turn 45 degrees to the right, 
So I'll just move the heading bog to south. Once the wings are level, I'm going to time for 30 seconds. There's the timer here. So, it's rolling wings level. I'll wait till the timer's here, and then we'll turn left 180 degrees. Just watching the altitude as well. I'll click the uh, altitude hold. I want to keep uh, 135 knots, or 130 knots. This is one of the procedure turns you can do. You can also do an 80 degree turn one way followed by a 260 degree turn the other. It still works. That's about 30 seconds. I'll come back around to the left. So coming around to heading north. As we come around on that heading, I'll put the aircraft into approach mode and uh, fly the ILS automatically uh, with the autopilot. There you go. So I'll click the approach button. See it arms approach. Still flying in heading mode. Drops into nav. It will turn on. I'll set the course pointer anyway, just so it's uh, something to, to reference in the event of a missed approach. So again, whatever I've got selected on the uh, OBS selector, it doesn't matter to me, but it does matter to the autopilot. Uh, the autopilot references the selected heading. Light slope uh, indicator is coming down, so what I'll do is uh, I'm below the, uh, the flap and gear limit for stage 1, so I'll put the gear down. It's like stage 1 flaps, or approach flaps. Speed will come back. I'll not make a power change because uh, it should all work out as we start downhill. And if you remember my rules of thumb video about descent rates, we're going to be going down the uh, glide slope about 110 to 100 knots ground speed towards the station. So if I half that, so 110 becomes 55, add on 10%, it's almost 600 feet a minute. Once we've intercepted, I'm expecting to see about 600 feet a minute, maybe a little bit less as we go down towards the station. And that's us. We're more or less on the glide slope, centralised on the localizer. Power set. At this point, I'll make sure that the uh, mixture's full rich. I can bring the props up. Do the uh, RPM required for a go round. I'll set it to full in this case, and make a little power adjustment, keeping the aircraft at a reasonable approach speed as we uh, come down the slope here. The great thing about the uh, the Baron and the uh, Bonanza, that sort of uh, aircraft, they've got quite high gear limiting speeds, so you can fly uh, a very high speed approach, uh, 160, 150 knots, and then use the gear as the brake. Uh, that'll let you fit in with uh, much faster traffic in the same circuit. Some aircraft like Moonies, I believe they've got speed brakes as well for the, the same reason. The faster you can fly the approach, um, the easier it is to fit in with larger commercial traffic. Let's have a look at the uh, map, because that's more or less the, uh, the mission complete for today. So, outbound from a NDB, changing to intercept another radio from the NDB, tracking towards and away from a VOR, flying a DME arc, flying outbound, turning to intercept another course inbound, flying inbound towards an NDB, adjusting to fly another course inbound to an NDB, Finally, flying down to intercept a beacon, a localizer, flying outbound, procedure turn, and then back down the ILS. 
If you're going to be flying things, uh, like I said, the uh, PMDG DC-6 or perhaps the uh, Fly JSIM 727 or 737 using the uh, radio navigation aids, then you can use exactly the same skills. The uh, speeds are just a little bit faster in those aircraft, but the equipment uh, may be a little bit more advanced with, uh, in some ways, maybe a little bit uh, more challenging in other ways, but the technology and how you employ it is the same regardless of the aircraft uh, type you fly. And that's what makes uh, learning how to fly an instrument in flight simulators really quite uh, rewarding. When I did my real world instrument rating test, I'd already flown the profile for the test five or six times in the simulator. And uh, it was really just a case of being aware of any of the traps on the, the routings you were going to use and how best to employ the aircraft to make it all work for you. As always, if you've got any questions or, or comments on the video, please feel free to leave them in the comments section. I'd really like to hear your thoughts on this. It's uh, a little bit out of the ordinary, this video, to do something uh, just looking at the, uh, the instruments uh, quite so long as that. That being said, I hope you found it informative, and uh, if you're flying some of these uh, older aircraft, I really hope you found it useful. Please let me know how you got on with it. Thanks very much for listening to me for so long, and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thanks very much.